Okay, so um, I got um, a couple of requests during the, um, the break just to clar clarify some things from last time. So what I want to do is just quickly give you a summary of what we did in the first half. So I talked about this basic setup of pack learning where uh, in a pack learning problem you have a concept class. This class is a set of functions from the in input space to 0, 1, or if you like, a, cl a collection of subsets of the, the input space. And we considered several examples, such, such as rectangles as a concept class, linear classifiers, neural nets, which are got by composing linear classifiers, so with a fixed architecture where you fix the graph, and the only thing that's varying are the weights of the neural net. So um, we talked about the notion of um, pack learnability of a, a concept class on the underneath, but that's, I'll, I'll say something about that. But after that, we talk about the notion of a VC dimension, the VC dimension of a, con, uh, a concept class. So this is a number. It could be finite or it could be infinity. What we're heading towards is the idea that a, a class is pack learnable if and only if it has finite VC dimension. That's the fundamental theorem. And as a stepping stone along the way, we talk about the growth function. So the growth function says all subsets of, so it's a function from n to n, and given, uh, uh, it's, it's defined by a concept class, so each concept class has its growth function. And for each m, the value of this is, I look at a, uh, any set of size m and look at what is the, most, the, the maximum number of labelings of a set that I can realise by concepts in the class. And that's, uh, so in particular, if it has infinite VC dimension, for every, every set of, uh, for every m, there's a set of size m that can be shattered. So the growth function in that case is 2 to the m for every m. But if it has finite VC dimension, the growth function is polynomial. And that's the reason we talk about the growth function is, is to prove this fundamental theorem that uh, finite VC dimension is packed learnable. And the most significant thing in the first half was just this definition of what it means for a concept class to be pack learnable. So this is, for all epsilon, this is the accuracy of the hypothesis that we want. For all delta, this is the confidence, this is like the failure probability that we just learn a terrible hypothesis. There exists M, the sample size that our learner needs to see in order to get this accurate hypothesis with this high confidence. There is, it, it exists an M in the learning map. So what the learning map does is it takes a labelled sample of size M and returns a classifier. So in the case of the rectangles, what the learning map would do is it would take a, a labelled sample, rectangles in the plane, it would take a labelled sample, which would be a bunch of points in the plane labelled positive and negative, and it would return a classifier, namely the smallest rectangle enclosing all the positive points. And so the learning map takes a sample, returns a classifier. This is what does the learning from the sam labeled sample, the classifier. And what we require that it be probably approximately correct. So approximately correct means the probability um, that the error, so given the sample, Here's the learned classifier. The probability that the error is less than epsilon, so that's the approximately correct, is uh, at least 1 minus delta, so that's probably. So the probability here is over the sample. So you draw a sample. If the sample is completely unrepresentative of, uh, of the true distribution, then you're dead, and you just learn a terrible classifier. But if it's representative, you learn a good classifier. And the point that's hidden there is the definition of error here refers, so there's this distribution, D in the background, fixed and unknown. The distribution is what you draw, when you draw your samples from the space, it's by this distribution. So that governs your samples. And the error of your learned hypothesis is also defined in terms of the distribution. It's the probability that your learned hypothesis differs from the target concept on, on, on a random example drawn according to D. So it's the closeness of the learned hypothesis to the target concept. So that's kind of my summary of, of the last time. And the what I'm heading towards now is concept class defined in first order logic. So I, I finished with this slide. So let me just give an example here. Here's a structure. It's the reals with order. So the signature is clear. And here's a formula. And the variables are partitioned into two kinds. And the way I'm thinking of this formula is I'm thinking that these these y variables, I call the parameters, these are defining the two corners of a rectangle in the plane. And x1 and x2 are some point which may or may not be in the rectangle. And what this formula says is that this point is in the rectangle. So x1 is between y1 and y3, and x2 is between y2 and y4. So this, 
This formula says this point is in the rectangle determined by these, these variables. So if I fixed values of the parameters, so B1, B4 are now particular real numbers, then I get a rectangle. So this is now a formula. So I, I, I define this notation here means a formula just in these two, two variables here. Um, so rather, it means the denotation of all the points that satisfy the formula. So what this thing here is, is the rectangle whose corners are determined by these parameters. So this is the rectangle. And this is the class of rectangle, so calligraphic C, as I let the parameters vary over all uh, four tuples of reals. So this concept class of rectangles is exactly realizable as a concept class of this form for this formula and for that structure. So here's a very generic way of getting concept classes with a single formula and a single structure. So that you vary the parameters, you get a different concept. And as you, uh, for every setting of the parameters, you have a concept. And as I remarked, neural nets can also be, over a fixed graph, can also be uh, realized in this way, in a hopefully uh, in intuitive way. So, and well, and what I really, and now I'm interested in the VC dimension of the concept class that I get from a formula and a structure. So let's see some examples of bounding that. So let's, here's a, here's a nice structure to consider. So the reals with addition and multiplication. So this is quite nice because now we can define polynomials. So here we have the reals with just order. But, um, um, and what I, I, I'm interested in is giving bounds on the VC dimension of the concept class that's determined by a particular formula phi in the structure in terms of the complexity of the formula phi. So phi is a formula of first order logic. And the key tool is, is the following to do this. So, um, so just say, why, actually, why would it be helpful to have addition and multiplication in your structure? So imagine that instead of axis-aligned rectangles, you wanted to define polygons in the plane, then your parameters would be the, would be the, um, the, the vertices of the, the polygon, and the, um, and, but you need a formula to say that the point lies inside the polygon, and, and for that you'd need to do a little bit of arithmetic. You couldn't just say it with order. So um, why do I keep on hiding the pens from myself? Um, so I could have, so if I had triangles, I could define them with six parameters. And I could imagine a formula that then tells me uh, whether a point lies inside uh, the triangle, but I'd need to do some uh, arithmetic to do that. So I, I'm working over this structure. So here's the, the key tool, which is a basic theorem in, in semi-algebraic uh, uh, geometry. So, it, I mean, it's ancient, so it's slightly tweaked by Goldberg and Jerome in their, their paper on, on neural nets. And it says the following. I consider fixed polynom uh, a collection of polynomials of, of degree at most d in k real, real variables. Then the number of realizable sign assignments, um, either pi being positive, negative, or zero, is at most this quantity, which is uh, exponential in the number of variables, but otherwise polynomial in the other data. So what I mean by realizable sign assignment is these are polynomials in k real variables. So if I plug in k real variables, the polynomials will either be positive, negative, zero, or zero. And this tells me the number of realizable sign assignments. And with this in hand, you can show the following. So let consider this structure. And let consider a formula here. So what is, what is a kind of formula you can write over this structure? So this structure has quantifier elimination. So let's even consider just quantifier-free formulas. So let this formula be a Boolean combination of... Um, uh, so what does a quantifier-free formula look like? It's a Boolean combination of uh, polynomial equalities and inequalities. And um, so let's suppose that there are S... Uh, um, polynomial inequalities and inequalities. So the atomic formulas, my phi, the atomic formulas in phi look like this. So some polynomial, how many variables are there? Um, yk. So here's an atomic formula, it's greater than zero. And the other, um, so it's strictly greater than zero. And let's suppose that these polynomials have degree at most d. Then the VC dimension, first of all, the VC dimension of this induced class is finite. And in particular, it is at most this number. So linear 
in the number of parameters. So this is the kind of magic uh, thing here, that here we have the parameters k, and we're linear in the number of parameters, OK? And um, in fact, um, uh, let me maybe give, let me give the argument here, uh, just so that hopefully it reinforces some of the concepts that we're, we're learning. So uh, what we want to consider, so we want to bound on the, v, so I've written VCD, it should be v, the VC dimension. I, I want to bound the VC dimension, so I want to bound the size of a set I can shatter. So uh, let's... Um, S equals, so how am I going to draw this? Um, A1, AM, uh, B shattered. So let me consider a, um, so this is a, so this is defining, a, a, um, so just to be clear, for every instantiation of the parameters, I get a concept, and the concept is on Rn. So I've got a, a set that's shattered. And um, so let me consider the formula. So um, let P be set of polynomials that appear in some formula phi a i for some, so I hope this is um, going to be visible for some a i. So what I'm going to do is I've got this set that I'm claiming to be shattered, and I've got this formula phi, so let me write the formula here, phi, and I'm going to plug in different values of of AI, and for every value of AI, I get a formula now in three variables, one up to K, and this, this formula is a, a combination of polynomials. So how many polynomials were there in phi? There were S polynomials. So when I plug in the values of these AI, I still have S polynomials. And there are uh, M values of A that I plug in, so the size of this set of polynomials is M times S. And the degree is still no bigger than it was before, is at most d. OK, so then the previous lemma of Warren tells me how many sign assignments there are to these, these polynomials. So uh, uh, let's make this observation that um, let's consider two parameters, two, two sets of parameters, b and b prime parameters. We're interested in shattering S, and the question is, um, these parameters induce some concepts, and the question is, do the concepts induced by these parameters have the same labeling on S? So they have the same labeling on S, induce same labeling on S, well, Actually, can someone tell me uh, if and only if what? So these two parameters are going to induce the same labeling on S if and only if I want to say something about the polynomials in P. So the polynomials in P are all polynomials I get by instantiating these, these uh, uh, elements of S. Yeah, exactly. So they, in, they induce the same labeling if, so I take the polynomials in P, these are polynomials in the parameter variables, if these polynomials have the same sign on uh, B as on B prime. So they, if, if and only if they have, they induce same sign assignment, same sign assignment on P. But by the previous lemma, we have an upper bound on the number of sign assignments that can be consistent sign assignments to a set P in terms of the number of polynomials and their degree. And so when you just push through the, the arithmetic, 
uh, you get a bound on the number of possible sign assignments. And you see that um, uh, you use the bound to show that um, uh, this bound is polynomial in, in, in M here. But in order for it to be shattered, the number of labeling should be 2 to the N. So for a certain M, 2 to the M is less than the polynomial in M. So you get a, an upper bound on the, on, on the size of the set that can be shattered. So I, I, I don't want to actually do the arithmetic because it somehow doesn't gain to be known. Um, but uh, but that's, how, that's how you prove the result. But the, the thing I really want to emphasize is that the number of... The VC dimension depends on the number of parameters, which is kind of the intuition we've been building up. And there was this one counterexample that we saw to this, which was the concept class de defined with sign. And the reason is that this, this, this is a nice re result on a number of kind of connected components, or as it were. Of the, um, so this is kind of, well, it's closely related to the fact bounds on the number of connected components of sets d defined in this structure. But if, if I admit functions like sign, then I get all these kind of wild... Um, properties. So here's a, a, a useful lemma in this setting, and this is a lemma um, uh, just coming purely out of model theory, and uh, it says the following. So um, again, what am I interested in is, just to remember this, what this notation means, is for a formula and a structure, I have a, it defines a concept class, name, which I was calling C of phi A, and this is the VC dimension of, of that class. And it says, well, um, suppose I have even a class of structures, and let me look at a formula like this. So this formula has parameters y1 up to yn, but just one variable x. So I'm defining a, a, um, a, a class of concepts just on the universe, but on, on one tuples. So not pairs or, or triples. So, the, so I've got a, a, a bound on the VC dimension of the one-dimensional sets I define. Then for free, I get a bound on the VC dimension of the set of M tuples for every M. So the bound is horrible, but, but, but I have that. So that means if I'm trying to bound VC dimensions, I can just care about um, uh, one tuples. So, um, uh, so just give you a, 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 um, an example of a proposition that just uses this theorem. So A is, let A be an O-minimal structure. So an O-minimal structure is a, a structure with order such that every, finite, every, um, every definable set is a finite union of intervals. Every definable subset, one-dimensional subset of the structure is, is, is a, a finite union of intervals. So, um, uh, you know, so here's a kind of the classic example of an O-minimal set. So if I think of a a subset of the reals definable by a formula with one free variable, it's a finite union of intervals. So if you think about it, it's kind of obvious when you think about it. So first of all, I don't need quantifiers because this structure has quantifier elimination. And then let me just think about the atomic formula. So an atomic formula that says some polynomial P of X is greater than zero, clearly that defines a finite union of intervals. And if I make Boolean combinations, I still have a finite union of intervals. Now, um, uh, what can you tell me about the VC dimension of, um, let, me, let me take uh, the, sub, the, the input space R, and let's say C be the union of two intervals. This is the concept class. So what is the VC dimension of this com uh, concept class on, this, on, on the reals? So what's the largest set I can shatter? My concepts are u disjoint unions of two intervals, or I mean, maybe overlapping unions of a single interval. Three. Um, yes, so I can, um, uh, no, or maybe four. Uh, I'm going to get confused between three and four here. So I'm going to say four. Uh, I can realize all labelings here with un uh, unions of intervals, I think, yes. Agreed? Yeah. Four. Okay. So, um, yeah, uh, but five I couldn't because I couldn't realize this uh, labelling. Okay. So the point is that the, the VC dimension is, well, again, the, it's defined by the number of parameters here, and the parameters are the endpoints of the intervals. So the VC dimension is finite. So, um, so what we know is that... Um, so, by Shalas' previous result, in order to show that the VC dimension of the set of concept class defined by a formula 
over this structure here is, is finite, it's enough to show it for every formula just in one variable. So with many parameters, but just with um, uh, one variable. So these are defining subsets of the reals. Now here's the key thing. So for every, um, for every set of parameters, so for every set of parameters, b1 up to bn, this, as I've said by O minimality, this set, which is a subset of the reals, is a finite union of intervals. But the key fact is that there's an absolute bound on the number of parts of this parameter as I vary b1 up to bn. So, um, uh, and that's just, just a general result about O minimal structures. Okay, so this gives me a, a bound on the, the VC dimension. So, and just to add that, uh, I said that the reals with multiplication and addition are O minimal, but also if you add exponentiation, you stay O minimal. This is uh, Alex Wilkie's result. Okay, so this gives you a, a bound on, on, on um, so for this structure, this gives you a bound. So this you can use for a bound on, on the VC dimension of sigmoidal neural nets. I mean, the terrible bound. So uh, if I add sine to this, is it still O minimal? So other definable, so the one dimensional definable set should be a finite union of intervals. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, indeed. So clearly, and as we saw, we, we had this concept class defined with sign that had infinite VC dimension. So um, these kind of results about logic can, uh, well, uh, can be used to give VC uh, bounds on, on neural nets with fixed architecture. So you fix the graph, uh, you have a, 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 a laid field, feed forward neural net, and N neurons, these are the, the, the number of, of nodes in the graph, and omega weights in total. So the weights are, so the edges of the neural network carry weights, and these are the number of weights. Then the VC dimension of the corresponding class of functions is. So just to recall, if I fix the architecture of the net, the graph, I get a class of functions by varying the weights. And this is what I, when I train the net, this is, you know, what I'm varying. So the VC dimension is, is proportional to the number of weights and neurons if the activation function is is piecewise polynomial. So it's a bunch of pieces and the pieces are polynomial. So for instance, the ReLU activation function would, be, uh, would, would fall into this. And um, uh, this is the bound if you have the sigmoidal activation function. So this bound doesn't come from this previous result about, I mean, the previous result I talked about O minimal structures would give you an absolutely a colossal bound. So this is from, uh, the second bound is a paper by Karpinski and McIntyre with a more kind of direct analysis of number of connected components, number of cells um, in, in that structure. Okay, so, uh, these are, so but there's somehow there's a close connection between bounding the VC dimension of logical formulas and, and neural nets. So I want to give a, another example, maybe more, on more like graph-like structures. So A here was the real numbers, a continuous structure. Now I'm thinking in terms of graphs, so I want to, um, uh, um, to bound the VC dimension uh, um, of concept classes um, as A ranges over a class of structures. So just to, uh, there's a lot of kind of going on there. So just to recall, we've got a fixed formula. with some variables and parameters, as it were. And it defines a concept class on, on given a um, structure, it defines a, a, a concept class. And the concept class is got by varying the parameters to get different concepts. And that concept class has a VC dimension, which we're calling VC 5A. And I've just pointed out that if you fix the structure, like the real, so the real field, then every formula has a finite VC dimension. And now what I want to do is I want to keep the formula fixed, but let the structure vary. And, so, and, I, and I'm interested in an, an, an upper bound on the VC dimension as I let the structure vary. Okay. Um, so, I mean, um, so maybe there's some motivation for this in maybe in, in some databases if you are trying to, um, you have some pattern of a query, you, you want to learn a query, and you, you know that your query is going to look like, um, 
you've got some formula in mind for your query and you see some positive and negative examples and you want to learn some parameters. So your query will be determined by putting some parameters in, in here. And you want to be able to learn the parameters. And, um, but you don't know the exact shape of the database, which is your, your underlying structure A. And so you want some absolute bounds on this v di VC dimension as A varies over a class of structures. Now, this is going to be impossible in general. And here's, a, here's an example. So a completely trivial formula. So the formula here is fixed. The formula, so the, the signature here is just the signature with a single binary relation. And let's consider the following structure. So I, I, I want a VC dimension bound over a class of all structures. So I, I consider a structure which is a bipartite graph with n nodes on the, on the left and with two to the n nodes on the right. And let's say this node is three. So uh, there's two to the n nodes on the right. And I've got an edge here just in case that the ith bit. So there's an edge here because the first bit in the binary expansion of one is, is, is set. The second bit is not set. Uh, oops, uh, so much for my binary skills. Um, yeah. Um, OK, so, uh, so in general, there's, a, there's a, an edge from i to j over here if the ith bit in the binary expansion of j is 1. OK, but then it's clear that I can shatter. So my formula is just phi xy is exy. So here are the, the kind of um, the parameters. And it's clear by instantiating with this parameter, I induce any subset of, of this set. So I can, I can shatter this set n. So the point is, by changing the structure, keeping the formula fixed and changing the structure, I have no bound on the, uh, the I have no, uh, I mean, the VC dimension can be as high as I like. So how can I, how can I, um, well, how can I hope for a result here? Well, let's just consider a less general class of structures. So again, I'm going to consider a class of graphs. And the graphs I want to consider are forests. So let these be kind of directed graphs that look like this. So every node is going to have um, at most one parent, and that pointer is going to point there. Maybe a, a node could be an orphan. And these, these trees here, in e each tree in the forest could be infinite, so this could descend like this. But this is what a forest looks like. So it's a bunch of trees with parent pointers, some orphans. That maybe there's infinite chains of descendants. So that's a forest. So, and I want K to be the class of all forests. And now the claim is that if I fix a formula, then I have an absolute uh, bound. So for any formula here, the VC dimension is bounded independently of the structure. So it's a forest, and it, it just depends on the formula, the bound. OK. Um, so if you like, forget about now the class of structures, just fix fix a forest and we want to bound on the VC dimension independently of, of the structure. And again, we can apply the Schiller result that says without loss of generality, we can consider our formula just has one, uh, I mean, apart from the parameters, it has one free variable. So we're just defining, what, we're def what this formula is defining is subsets of the, of, of the, of the structure. So uh, let's fix a formula of quantified depth K. And I'm going to argue that there are two kinds of sets that cannot be shattered by the concept class that arises by varying the parameters here. So, um, yeah. So, uh, so just a, a bit of just notation. So in this, this is my forest. Um, but for any two nodes in the forest, I want to talk about their distance. And their, so their, their distance in the forest is just... If I look at the underlying undirected graph of the forest, that's an undirected graph, and then the two nodes have a distance in this graph. So these two nodes have distance infinity. They're not connected, but these two nodes here and here have distance 2. These have distance 3. So every node have, has distance. And um, uh, I claim the following, that a sufficiently large set, which is a subset of the forest, such that for distinct A, B in the set, their distance is greater than 4K, where K is the quantified depth, it, this can't be shattered. So it's a, it's a bunch of points in the forest, and they're all far apart. Think of, think of it like this, and far apart relative to the quantified depth of the formula. 
And just to be clear, how are we going to shatter this such a set? We're going to shatter it by taking this formula and varying the parameters and therefore realize every dichotomy, every labeling of that set. I claim also that a sufficiently large set uh, S, such that all the points in the set are close, cannot be shattered. So if you would grant me these claims, can someone tell me why this gives me a bound? Why, why, why for instance, this now tells me that the VC dimension is finite of the, of the set. So I've got these two kinds of unshatterable sets. So to, to show the VC dimension is finite, I need to show that there's some number such that no set of a certain size can be shattered beyond that number, beyond that size. So why is it enough to, to show that I can't shatter sets of this special form? So, I mean, suppose I take a, a large set that I want to shatter. Can I argue that such a, a, a set should contain uh, either one of these guys, if it's big enough, one of these types of sets or one of these types of sets? How, how could I make such an argument? So this is a set where every distinct pair of points in the set are far apart, and this one is where every distinct pair is close. Uh, yeah. So basically, by the physical principle, we don't have that uh, the graphs spread a lot, and then we can kind of find enough points uh, which are with medium range. Yeah, I mean, this is the right intuition. There's some pigeonhole principle going on, and specifically, it's the Ramsey theorem. So I, I um, you know, if I um, Ramsey theorem says, well, given, uh, I mean, if I color an edge between two points if they're close together. Given a sufficiently large graph, there's either a, 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 a big clique or a, 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 a clique of a certain size or an anti-clique of a certain size. So just by the Ramsey theorem, I have this. So it suffices to show that I cannot set, sh shatter sufficiently large sets where everything are close and, and sufficiently large sets where everything is far apart. So, um, I mean, let's just briefly consider a, a large set where everything is far apart and kind of let's see why I can't sh shatter. So, um, so here's a forest. So clearly, it's clearly a depiction of a forest. And here is a set um, where every element in the set is far apart. And I said sufficiently large. And so well, let me just draw my formula that I want to do the shattering with. It looks like this. So it has n parameters. And let me have... Um, a, so A3n, A3n plus 1, A4n. So what I'm going to claim is that this set that I can't shatter, so I want to prove the first claim. I, 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 I claim that I can't shatter a set of 4m elements, 4n elements in the set, um, which are all far apart in the, in the, in the, the forest. So why is this? Well, uh, I need to, uh, in order to shatter this set, I would in particular be able to need to um, uh, realize a labeling where exactly half of the guys get labeled positive. So try to realize the 50-50 labeling. So the labeling where exactly half of these guys get labeled positive and exactly half negative. And what I want to do is, by instantiating the parameters here, have, have, the, have a formula that is satisfied by exactly half of the guys. So I'm going to instantiate the parameters with some, some concrete values from the, from the forest, and I want exactly half of these guys to be true. OK, so these parameters live in the forest and, uh, with the trees. And, um, and the thing is, these points are all far apart. So a parameter here could be close to one of these, these guys, and by close, I mean, I could have some parameter close to... So far apart here means distance 4k, where k is the quantified depth. And this is what close means. This could be close to, to this, but it can't be close to two of them. 
These, these, these are far apart, so the parameters can be close to at most one um, uh, at most one of the AIs that we want to shatter. So here are my n parameters, and without loss of generality, I can assume that these parameters are all far apart from a, uh, a1 up to 3n, because this one's, say, close to this. C2 is close to a n, a3n plus 2. So I've got this situation. So my parameters are all far apart. Um, yeah. And now, uh, yeah, so I neglected to tell you one very important point about these, this set here. Um, I'm going to assume that um, that AI and AJ satisfy the same formulas formulas psi x of quantified depth k. So in other words, I'm assuming that the k types of AI and AJ are the same. So these, four, these points I'm assuming are indistinguishable by one variable first order uh, logic formulas of depth K. And I can assume this because there are finitely many uh, 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 types. So if I restrict the quantified depth and the number of variables, there are finitely many formulas of first order logic up to, um, uh, up to a logical equivalence. So th this is finite. So I can make this assumption that these are indistinguishable by, uh, these points here are all indistinguishable by first order formulas with one free variable and quantified at k. So now I claim that because of this, so this is just locality of first order logic, that the type of uh, AI and the parameters C1 up to Cn, so I hope that people at the back, so Alexandra told me not to write at the bottom, but I'm living dangerously. Um, so I claim this for all the distinct pairs i and ij in among these among these guys. So for all one less than ij less than three n. So what's the situation? I've got guys that are far apart. I've got these parameters that are over here, and these guys have the same types, and therefore. So by general properties of first order logic, um, the type of this tuple is the same as the type of this tuple. And in particular, they're indistinguishable by formulas of quantified depth k, in particular by this, this formula here. OK, so that's kind of hard work. So that's, um, that's detailed. So, um, uh, so this, uh, I mean, I, I, I won't cover the second bullet point, but this proves the, the, the result that the quantified depth is bounded. And there's a nice uh, kind of, well, it's not quite a generalization, but, um, well, I guess it is a generalization. This is Martin Gray and again Turand that said, if I have a relational signature, so a first order signature with relations, and I have a class of structures of bounded tree width, then for any formula phi now of, with second order quantifiers, monadic second order logic, if I, look at the if I look at the concept class C phi A and let A vary over this class of formulas with an absolute bound on the tree width, then the, the, um, then the, um, the VC dimension is again bounded, absolutely bounded. And this is, rather than talking about types, they, they use tree automata for this. Okay, so um, just to recap, I mean, you know, just in case you're lost, they'll give a chance to reconnect because we defined concept classes by formulas of some structures, and we really were interested. So this is the logic and learning part of it. We have a concept class um, defined by a formula and a structure, and the concepts are got by varying the parameters. And the idea is the first thing we said is, well, let's fix the structure to be something we're really interested in, like the reals with exponential. And then the concepts that we can define maybe match with the thing, concepts we're interested, concept classes we're interested in, like neural nets. We can get general bounds on the VC dimension. Now, uh, I haven't yet said that finite VC dimension equals learnability, and so I'll, I'll say next. And then the other thing we, we did is we let the, we let the, the structure vary over um, a class of reasonable structures, such as structures with tree width at most 10. And again, we bounded the, the VC dimension of all the concept classes we could have, just as long as they were defined in a reasonable um, fragment of logic, so in this case, case MSO. Okay. Um, are there any questions? 
Oh yeah, so the signature in the case of the forest was a it just one relation. Uh, it was just one relation whose which was the which was realized as the as a function, namely the parent function. Yeah, so bi binary relation symbol. Um, uh, yeah, I'm a little bit confused. Uh, did we, uh, I, I should go till half past twelve? Yeah. Okay. Uh, yeah. Okay. So, okay, um, I want to jump over this. So, okay, I've been talking about VC dimension a lot, and if you know what VC dimension is, then you're happy, maybe. Or maybe if you know it too well, you're like, I, I know all this. But if you don't know much, you'll be like, well, I came to hear about learnability, and all you're talking about is VC dimension. So why, why am I talking about VC dimension? Well, here's a, a, a kind of fundamental theorem. And somehow, okay, so if, if I want to kind of tell you one thing here um, to kind of... Keep in mind, I think it would be the kind, there's a very neat trick in the proof of this theorem, and I just want to, it's very standard, it's somehow it's very common in learning theory, but I just want to explain it because it's very nice. I think Varun will build on it in his, his lectures, I expect. There's um, a neat trick called the, called the kind of symmetrization double sampling trick. So here's the key, key theorem, the fundamental theorem. So let C be a concept class of finite VC dimension D. Let epsilon and delta be given, and let m be such that m is at least, well, some function that involves the VC dimension and the epsilon and delta. In particular, the smaller that epsilon and delta are, the bigger m should be. And we've seen expressions like this before. If you remember the sample bound, the number of samples we needed to learn rectangles in the uh, axis-aligned rectangles, it looked something like this, not unlike this, where d was 4 the VC dimension of rectangles. So let M be big enough. Then for any target concept that we want to learn and distribution D on the um, input space, the probability that a sample of size M is consistent with some hypothesis H. So we had drawn a sample. It's labeled by this target concept. The probability that it's, it happens to be consistent with some hypothesis that has error greater than epsilon is at most delta. So why is this uh, map important? Why is this sorry, theorem important? So let's think about our learning map. What does our learning map do? Is it, it maps, I mean, the most obvious way to define a learning map is to take a sample and map that sample to some hypothesis that predicts the labels on the sample. So we call that a consistent hypothesis. OK, that seems like a sensible thing to do. So what could go wrong if you do that? Well, what could go wrong is you pick a hypothesis, let's call it a bad hypothesis, that happens to agree with the target on the sample you've drawn, and yet has error greater or equal to epsilon. So again, the error here is the probability, if I draw x according to d, that hx is unequal to the target. So h is a bad hypothesis if its error is greater or equal to epsilon. So I'm bounding the probability of a bad event if the sample is large enough. And what's key here is this is over any hypothesis. So C is, a, in general, an infinite set, and this is where the finite VC dimension is, is key to, to make this work. So the corollary here is VC cl classes are packed learnable, namely by the, 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 the learning function just pick, pick a consistent hypothesis. So any questions about that? Um... So I want to, um, I mean, just, just, just to be completely explicit about this, so, I mean, just to go back to this, you know, this, yeah. Ah, oh, okay, that's a very good point. So how do I know it exists? Well, I'm, in, I, I'm assuming there's a target concept. So this is, out there there's a target concept. So when I draw a sample, what do I see? I draw a sample, and I see the following. So I pick, I draw these from the input space according to the distribution. And what I see is the sample and the label according to the target. So if you think of this learning rectangles in the plane, what did I see? I see some points in the plane. And I also see their label that says they're inside the target. 
and they're outside the target. So there's a more general setting, the, non, the so-called agnostic setting, where you don't even know that they're, I mean, which is the real world setting. Of course, I'm learning spam. It's not the case that there is a, there is a, a target, really, that's a linear classifier. Okay, but it exists because by, by construction. So I can't, I, if, I, learn, if I, I fit a consistent hypothesis, I can't go wrong. And um, I want to just go through a little bit the, the this will be the last proof I, I do, so I need to make progress. So this is a so-called double sampling trick. So this is a very nice trick, and it's where the growth function and VC dimension come in. So uh, first idea we want to have is that if I draw two samples of size M from the distribution, then intuitively, if the VC dimension of my class C is bounded, then these two samples should behave similarly with respect to every statistical test from uh, C, with high probability over the, over the samples. So specifically, what do I mean by this? So the probability that where I draw samples S1 and S2 of M elements from D, I'm interested in the probability that there exists a hypothesis that somehow distinguishes them. And by distinguishes them, I have, I claim, uh, uh, well, the following is the, the kind of way in which H distinguishes them, so I shall define you some terminology. So looking in the background, I've got this target concept C, and the error of a hypothesis uh, over S is, so S here is a sample that I've drawn of M elements. This is the proportion of elements such that... Um, HXI disagrees from the true uh, label, I equals 1 up to M. So error, so error of H is somehow the true error over the distribution D, and this is the error on the sample. So I look at the sample and I say, how many did, H, how many, did you, how many labels did you get wrong in the sample as a proportion of the sample? And that's the error. And I'm interested in, does there exist a hypothesis such that the error on the first sample is zero? So the hypothesis is consistent on the first sample, and yet when I look at the second sample, it seems to have a non-trivial error. And I'm saying, what is the probability that I draw two samples, there exists a hypothesis with this, um, with this discrepancy? And um, I want to claim that it's less than delta over 2. Well, the hidden assumption here is if m satisfies the, the bound from my theorem. So my overall theorem says if M is sufficiently large, then I, um, well, then I have desired behavior. So I'm saying if M uh, um, satisfies this. So now here's the neat trick. So um, uh, imagine the following experiment. I draw two M elements, a sample of two M elements from this distribution D independently. And for, uh, no. For i equals 1 up to m, sorry, this shouldn't be m, I swap xi with xi uh, m with probability half. So I swap the first guy with, um, so here's my sample, x1, xm, xm plus 1, x2m. So I draw this sample, and then I swap these two with probability half, and I independently swap the next two with probability half, and so on. So imagine just doing that. This is, this is an experiment you might do. And then you say, well, I'm going to set S1 to be the first M guys after doing the swapping and S2 to be the, the next M guys after doing the swapping. So here's a question. What is the distribution on S1 and S2, the sets that I obtain? If I do this, I draw 2M, do the swapping, and then partition them off into S1 and S2. What's the distribution on S1 and S2? Or can you describe more simply the distribution that I get? Yeah, it's, it's, it's the same distribution as if I were just to draw two sets separately. So what I was interested in here is the probability that if I independently draw two sets, that they differ according to some hypothesis. And now I'm saying, well, this is the way I'm going to draw the sets. So how could this, how could this help by doing this kind of convoluted way of drawing the sets? So this helps me to bound the probability of this event because now I can condition on the choice of this sample. So, um, so fix S. So fix a choice of S. Fix a choice 
of um, S equals There's still some randomization left here because I've got the swapping. But at least if I fix this, I claim that conditioned on this fixed choice of, of S, for any fixed choice, this, uh, the probability of this event here is at most delta over 2. So we'll call the event E. So E here determines, stands for this event here, the one whose probability I want to bound. And I claim that the probability of E conditioned on S is less than delta over 2 for all s, uniformly for every fixed choice of s. OK, now why is that? So um, what, how could it be that uh, I've got h? Um, so let's actually just draw a little picture. Uh, I've got some hypothesis. So let's even fix an h. Fix H. So what do I see when I draw S? I see two M elements. And underneath each element, I can write uh, a tick or a cross. And I write a tick if H agrees with the target on that element, and a cross if it doesn't. So if I fix a hypothesis, so I'm worried about there exists a hypothesis that has no uh, errors on, on S1 and lots of errors on S2. So if I fix a hypothesis, I, I, S is fixed. So if I just look at a hypothesis here, then how could I be in this bad situation? Well, the bad situation will occur is if I've got a bunch of uh, crosses. And when I do the swapping, I move all the crosses into the second half and all the ticks into the first half. Well, the probability of that is small. If there are, en if there are enough crosses, the probability of that is small. But the problem is the following. So I can bound the probability of this event for any fixed h, but I need to bound it for every, every h. So I need to, so if I just, I, here I'm quantifying over h. If I fixed an h, then I'd be basically home free. The probability would be small if m were large enough. But how do I deal with the fact that h is not fixed? So here's where the, 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 VC, where the growth function comes in. Because the number of choices so the number of H's in the concept class is fixed, but the number of choices of H restricted to S, so we fixed S, we're conditioning on S, is polynomial in M. So this is by the growth function. The growth function just tells me how many labelings of, of S are realisable by different H's. So in fact, I really only need to consider polynomially many in M different H's. For each H, when it's fixed, I can give a, a, a probability bound that this random swapping moves all the, the crosses into the other side. This is exponentially small in M for every fixed H, and there are only polynomially many H's on S. Polynomially many in M. And that's what gives me my bounds. So, um, so what that shows me is that with high probability over all uh, uh, um, hypotheses, the probability I'm consistent on S1 and, and revealed to have high error on S2 is small. And, um, okay, so uh, I need to make progress. So let me, um, so let me, I'm going to jump ahead. This is very bad. Um, uh, I want to, let me prove the theorem. So, um, how do I relate this doubling, double sampling situation to what I'm really interested in? So what I'm really interested in is the probability of the following bad event. So I'm trying to learn, and I'm learning, I, I output as a learner a consistent hypothesis, and the bad event is, oh, it's consistent with the sample, but in fact it has high error in general. This is the bad event A. There exists a hypothesis in C whose error is greater, equal, is greater or equal to epsilon, and it's consistent with the sample I've drawn. And here's, so this is the event whose probability I want to bound. This is the event whose probability that I know I can bound by the previous uh, reasoning. The probability that there exists a hypothesis uh, whose error is greater to epsilon, which is consistent on S1, and it has at least m epsilon over two errors on S2. So these are the two samples, S1 and S2, and this is the, the, the hypothesis that differs between them. 
I've thrown in the extra requirement that the error is greater or equal to the epsilon, but that even makes the result holds even more. And here's the key, key thing why the double sampling trick uh, works is the following observation. Um, the, the, so A is in fact, uh, uh, B is a subset of A, B is a sub-event of A, and uh, so now by what I skipped over the Chernoff bound, the probability of B given A is greater or equal to half, so I'll, I'll prove this by intuition. So um, I'm in the situation where A has happened, so what is A? There's a hypothesis that's consistent on S1, but actually it has... Uh, uh, it's actually not a very good hypothesis. It's just by bad luck it was consistent on our sample S1. Okay, and there's this, well, actually, there is at least one of them, but let's fix that one. And we're interested in the event B that there's a, a hypothesis that's a consistent on S1, and on a second sample is revealed to have lots of errors. But in fact, it's very likely if the error, true error rate of this is greater or equal to epsilon, it's very likely that on the second sample, if, if the sample is big enough, with probability a half, that it actually has at least uh, uh, m epsilon over two errors, or its error rate on the second sample is at least epsilon over two. That just follows from, from a, a, a concentration bound, that I take a sum of lots of independent random variables, it's concentrated around the mean. So if I just fix the, if I fix a single hypothesis, then yes, on a sample, if the, if the sample is big enough, then the, the error rate is going to be close to the true error rate, and, and that's, so this is, this is what gives this line. And basically then we're home free because we know we're interested in bounding the probability of A and we already have a bound on the probability of B and we know this, we know this is greater or equal to a half. So basically with, with some simple uh, arguing we're home, home free. So I, I mean just, so I realized I, I went over this rather quickly. There are two things I really want to, to emphasize. So we, we sometimes have to use a Chernoff bound and, but the Chernoff bound is not enough. The Chernoff bound just says that if I have a single hypothesis and I draw a sample, then um, the sample gives me the error rate accurately of, of, of that single hypothesis. But I need to bound over the class of all hypothesis, hypotheses, which is where this double sampling trick and the, the growth function bound uh, came in. Okay, so... Um, so basically, what this says is if the VC dimension is finite, then there's a bound on the sample size, which is enough to learn. And there's a converse. If the VC dimension is, is infinite, then no finite set of samples is enough to learn. And this, uh, this is a nice application of the, the, the probabilistic method, the proof of this. So I've got a concept class that has VC dimension at least D. Then for any learning algorithm, there exists a bad target concept that... Con uh, um, should be C and C, and a bad distribution, such that if I only give D over two examples to the learning algorithm, then the, 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 the hypothesis has, um, with some non-trivial probability, a bad error, a constant error. So in fact, VC dimension finite, if and only if, uh, pack learnable. Okay, so, um, so what I kind of just want to kind of... Um, so I think I, I, well, I say remember this slide for later. Uh, I'm going to make it extremely hard for you just by skipping over it. <laughs> and, uh, but I'll make it easy for you by coming back. So I, I just want to, to explain, so, so maybe at a slightly less technical level, the, the notion of a sample com compression scheme, because this is a really nice connection between logic and learning, which I really want to get in if I have time. So, um, uh, so this is going to uh, give you another characterization of packed learnability. So I have a concept, concept class, and I define the notion of a sample compression scheme for a complex, uh, uh, concept class. So it consists of a number k, which is called the kernel, kernel size, and a finite set i, which stands for an information set, such that the following, uh, with the following data. So it's a, a compression map. So what does the compression map take? It takes a labeled sample. So here, uh, s is a subset of the input space. And f is a function from s to 0, 1. So it's a, it's a set of instances labeled uh, positive and negative. And what the compression map sends this to is a subset of the sample of size k plus a finite bit of information on the side. I'll give several examples in a second just to, to, to make this, run this home. 
So what it maps the sample to is a subset of the sample and um, with the labels and a finite bit of information on the other hand. So it's just a sampling from, it's taking a subset of the sample. And then there's a reconstruction map which takes, whose domain is the same as the codomain of the compression map. So it takes this, this labeled sample of size k, the kernel size and the information, and it reconstructs a, a, a hypothesis. And um, it's a sample compression scheme if, when I take a, a big sample and then I compress it using kappa, and then I reconstruct it using rho, so I get a function like this. When I restrict to s, I get back uh, the labels of my original sample. That's what a, a, a sample compression scheme is. So I think to understand this, we need to see an example. So <laughs> go to the, um, so will be the rectangles in the plane lecture. Um, so I, um, yeah, so uh, let me just go back to the, the what was the domain of, of, of this? So the domain is samples labeled according to concepts in the concept class. So what does one of these look like with, for rectangles in the plane? So, um, so let me draw invisibly the target concept or a concept C and C. And here's a sample that's labeled according to this concept. So what I want to do a, compre a compression map is going to map this sample, and I, I claim this into a, a, sub, a subset such that I can reconstruct the labels of the whole sample from the subset. So what subset should I select? And how many elements? Yeah? Yeah, the four corners. So if I... Yeah, the four corners, these... This subset of the sample... Uh, so the compression map will take this labeled sample and map it to these four guys. And then the reconstruction map uh, will map, will, will say, well, I construct this hypothesis. And that hypothesis will correctly predict the label of all the, um, of all the, um, of all the, the, the points in my original sample. Uh, so what about interval, uh, are there any questions about that? Um, okay, so what about intervals in the line? Uh, so let's say, um, so, so C, say C is the collection of unions of three intervals in R. So what does a labeled sample look like for a start? Well, it's a sample of points that are labeled according to some concept in C. So maybe I see something like this. So you agree that this, this looks like um, uh, a labeled sample. Now, how should I compress this? Which, which, which are the kind of the important sample points for the compression? That, yeah. Yeah, so the first positive point, maybe, maybe the first negative point beyond that, the next positive point. So the, the sign changes, essentially, because then I'll guess. So the compression map will, will, will send to the subset of the samples the, the points where the sign changes, and the reconstruction map will will construct a hypothesis. So just to recall the reconstruction map, just what its type is, that's what it, it maps. So just to recall the type of the reconstruction map is it takes this, well, in, in these examples, there's no side information. It just takes the subset of the, 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 the sample and gets you a function. So the reconstruction map is generating you a, a, a hypothesis. Uh, half spaces, this maybe is a bit more non-trivial. So um, I've got a labeled, I've got now, say, again in the plane, so that's, that's the only thing I can draw. I've got some points in the plane that are labeled according to some half space. So I want to um, uh, I want to kind of say that the well what, what should the compression map remember from seeing this? So what what is um, exactly support vectors? So um, so if you know so uh, 
as a classical machine learning algorithm support uh, vector machines, and what this, uh, uh, I mean, I mean, if you want to learn a linear classifier, a natural linear classifier to learn in here is the one with maximum margin. So what I mean by this is here's a linear classifier that classifies these, that's consistent with this, and the margin is the, uh, the, margin is the distance to the closest point. So and it should be the same on both sides. But um, These are the points which are closest to the classifier. So I've picked a classifier with maximum margin, and, the, and this can be solved by a um, convex optimization problem. And I've um, picked these two points of maximum margin. So these are what are called support vectors. And in fact, this, this, margin is, this classifier is determined completely by the support vectors. So the compression map picks out the support vectors, and the reconstruction map takes the support vectors and reconstructs the cl classifier. So just to emphasize, the classifier is determined completely by the support vectors. It's actually very clear when you, you, you set out the optimization problem. Yeah. Yeah, well, okay, so what is the support vector? So let's say uh, we understand what a, a linear classifier is, and then I define the margin of a classifier as the, the distance to the closest point. So this, 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 thing, this, this line doesn't pass through any points, but there's a distance to the closest point. That's called the margin. And a point whose distance is exactly equal to the margin is a support vector. But it so happens, for instance, the, the normal of the classifiers is actually in the span of the support vectors, but... Just for the definition here, a support vector is the point that's closest to the classifier. And these determine the classifier. So this is a subset of, of um, uh, yeah. Sorry? Yeah, so the subset of the sample is the, um, well, uh, is the support vectors of the maximum margin classifier. So you have a sample. There exists a, a linear classifier that has maximum margin. So we know that the sample is linearly separable because we're, it was labeled by some, some linear classifier from here. So there exists a linear classifier, and in particular, there exists one of maximum margin. And for such a sat satisfier, the, the guys that are, are exactly on these margins are the support vectors, the, 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 the things from my labeled sample. Uh, uh, well, it depends, uh, it, well, uh, it, uh, well, it may be not in this case, um, I mean, it, it's clear that the support vectors determine this, I think, from when you set up the, if you look at the, the dual optimization problem, I agree that in this case, it's clear that the, uh, the two do not, are not enough. But in this case, I think there should be two support vectors. I think that should be the case. Uh, yeah. Okay. I need to. You need, I'll need to get back to you on that one. So uh, and if, somehow, somehow analytically, if you if you look at the dual optimization problem, it seems clear. But um, yeah. So by the way, I should just say that um, I mean I'm rushing and, and fumbling and bumbling, but I have notes and they should be reasonably um, uh, uh, watertight, and I'll then. Um, I'll uh, uh, spread these out um, uh, 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 later in the afternoon or tomorrow. Okay, so one last example of a compression scheme, and this is, gives you a kind of, um, let's kind of go out of our, our uh, boring pack world and, and consider a different type of learning algorithm that's going to give us a compression sc scheme. So um, uh, here's a learning algorithm, so it's a so-called mistake-bounded, mist mistake-driven online learning algorithm. And this is going to give us a, 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 comp a sample compression scheme. Um, so, uh, so let's just have a quick excursion into online learning. So um, it, online learning works as follows. So you're, you're given, uh, so there's, forget, there's no probability distribution anymore, uh, as, as in pack learning. You're just given a set of examples. So you read in a set of examples, so there's an input space, and you read in a set of examples, and you're required to predict the label of an example. Is this a yes or is this a no? And so you predict yes. And then uh, some referee says, you were wrong, mistake, uh, it was a no. And then the next one comes in and you predict the, uh, predict the, uh, the label of this. Is this a yes or a no instance? And you say it's a yes. And the referee says, no, you're wrong, it was a no. Now, okay, this seems like a biased game, 
Uh, but here is, a, the game is not quite as rigged as it may sound because there is lurking, let's say, a concept class. And what the referee uh, must do, I mean, uh, to play fairly, is that the answers of the referee on these inputs must be consistent with some concept in here. So there must exist a concept in here such that this is the concept that the referee had in mind. So he can't just, just contradict everything you say. And, yeah, so in some sense, he doesn't have to commit to it. I mean, just as long as his answers just have to be consistent with some concepts. Yeah, indeed. And so in, in like, like he, has a little, he or she has a little bag of concepts, and maybe you know, every time they give an answer, they, lose, they have to eliminate some from the bag, but they just need to be consistent. And so, you know, and how is your learning algorithm working? How are you making these predictions? Maybe you have in mind a working hypothesis, which is maybe a concept, and you make these predictions according to the working hypothesis. And every time you make a mistake, you try and update your hypothesis. So here's an example of such an algorithm. So the concept class here is the class of monotone, disjunction, uh, monotone disjunctions. So uh, the input space here is 0, 1 to the n. And the concept class is so the propositional formulas, monotone disjunctions. So they are things of the form P2 or P4, or P7. OK. And, um, well, what's the desideratum of the, of the learning algorithm? We want to give a mistake bound. We want to say we, we're going to give a bound on the total number of mistakes we make until we're perfect, until the, every, every, every prediction we, we make is agree, uh, matched by the referee. And um, the, the prediction we're going to give is... Um, so we're going to give a, a, an algorithm that has a mistake bound. Well, let me explain the algorithm before the mistake bound. So the algorithm is going to use as its working hypothesis a linear classifier. And uh, its working hypothesis is going to be uh, a linear classifier of the following form. And these are weights. So these xi... Uh, uh, so that our, uh, are determined by the so our, our input space is uh, n vectors and uh, uh, vec uh, zero one vectors in n in, in n um, dimensions uh, and so we're given the example which is a zero one vector in uh, n, um, n dimensions and we output one so our, our, all our weights are initialized to one and we output one if the following linear sum is greater or equal to n so we say this is a positive example. And we say it's a negative example otherwise. Now, the referee tells us whether we made a mistake. And what do we do if we made a mistake? Well, um, it depends whether we made a mistake on a, on a positive example. So the first kind of mistake we could make is we predicted ne negative when we should have predicted positive. So what we say is, well, there, the, um, uh, our weights, some weights actually somehow got it right and some got it wrong. The ones that got it wrong, if, if xi was equal to 1, uh, and we should have been positive, then in fact, this, this guy was actually correct, this, this weight wi, and so we, as a reward, we double it. So we were wrong, but um, uh, uh, wi, which contributed to our, us being right, is, is, is doubled. If, on the other hand, we predict positive when we should have predicted negative, well, who are the villains? The villains are the, the weights wi, where xi on that example, the, the i uh, 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 entry was 1. So we have uh, these, these weights. And we keep on, on, on going. And then the mis mistake bound we get, so if, so if labels, so, so labels are consistent with classifier so uh, this is our concept class. So notice that the learning algorithm is not actually not using uh, something from our concept class. It's using a linear classifier. But if the, if the, the labels are consistent with a classifier C with uh, R disjuncts, then the mistake bound is something like 3R log of N. So this is the mistake bound. This is a total bound on the number of mistakes. And this is very nice because... Um, in some sense, we don't have linear dependence on the dimension n, which could be huge. 
we just have linear dependence on the number of, of uh, disjuncts in the, the target concept. So this is somehow, the idea is that you'll learn, there, are, re, re, there are a few relevant attributes and your, your mistake bound is determined by these uh, relevant attributes. Okay, so that was an excursion into the Winnow algorithm, an online algorithm and, and mistake bounds. Um, what does any of this have to do with compression schemes? So, um, by the way, I, I would say that this, this algorithm is called mistake-driven because you update the hypothesis only when you make a mistake. When you don't make a mistake, you keep the hypothesis the same. So how could we get a compression scheme from such an algorithm? So... Um, a, comp a compression scheme for what? So let's suppose we've got, let's see, let the concept class C be, again, monotone disjunctions. And we've got a sample that we want to compress. So what, was, what, 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 what does our sample look like? It looks, I guess it would look something like this. So it would consist of a bit vector and a label positive, let's say, and another bit vector, another label, and then another ve bit vector, and then another label. So this sample is, where does this sample live? This is a labeled sample of n bit vectors. And the labels we know come from a monotone disjunction. Okay. And we want to define a compression map that's somehow going to pick a subset of the labeled examples such that the reconstruction map can reconstruct uh, a function that predicts the rest of the labels of the sample. It doesn't have to be a subset, right? Uh, it does have to be a subset in the, the formulation I've given, yeah. So, um, yeah. So, it, we want it to be a subset. Maybe, you know, maybe plus some, some information, but... Um, and we want to use the, the, the mistake bound learning algorithm to, to, to get this, yeah? Because we use simple ones where if you would learn that one by one, uh, where you would make a mistake. Yeah. And then you can just replay on those, and then you don't you know you will learn exactly the same thing because the algorithm only changes the classifier on a mistake. Exactly. So let me just repeat this so we're on camera. So you. Um, you, you assume there's some order on the bit vectors, and you to, to compress, you run the, uh, the mistake-driven, mistake-bounded learning algorithm on the, these inputs, and you just remember the ones where you made a mistake, and that's your compressed set. And then when you want to recover the, the labels of, a, of, a, of a, the label of a given guy in your, your sample, what you do is you just you can just rerun, you, you've remembered the ones where you made a mistake, so you re, rerun. The, the, the learning algorithm on the, on, on the, on the ones that precede, precede the, the, the guy whose label you want to predict. Um, so in fact, I, sorry, you, you gave a very um, eloquent des description of this, which I man managed to mangle, but that was the, um, the, the, that's the correct answer. So, um, uh, so, yeah, so just to go back. So the, all these, these um, concept classes have sample compression schemes. Now, what's the com connection with v VC dimension? So, well, the connection is that a concept class has a sample con con uh, compression scheme just in case it has finite VC dimension, just in case it's learnable. And uh, so there are two things to prove, and one of which is, is somehow a relatively recent result. So this result goes back to the invention of the, the notion of sample compression scheme by Littleston Wormuth. So he says, let's see be a, con a concept class on an instant space that has a sample compression scheme of kernel size k. So the kernel size is the size of subsamples to which you compress. Then given epsilon and delta, then some expression of the kind that we've seen lots of that we kind of are beginning to recognize that if our sample size is at least this, so there's a dependence here on epsilon and delta and on the kernel size here in the information set, then we have a learning function. And the learning function takes samples of size m and returns uh, functions uh, hypothesis. And what is the learning function? It's just got by composing the compression and reconstruction maps. So you take a sample. So what is your learning function? You take a sample sufficiently large. You compress it. And then you use the reconstruction map to correctly predict the labels of, of the sample you took from this compressed uh, set. 
And then you say, actually, this should be a good hypothesis. This should generalize well on unseen, del uh, un unseen data. So, I mean, I, I, I don't get the proof, but why intuitively should this work? Well, the intuition is that the reconstruction map is the one that builds your hypothesis. And the hypothesis built by the reconstruction map only depends on a small fraction of the, del uh, of the data. So somehow it's, it's not going to overfit. So it's, um, it's a function of a small fraction of the, of, of the data. And so it's going to generalize well. So, and, and the proof is, is not difficult. Yeah, and so, so cannot overfit. So the interesting direction is the other way. So if I have a, 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 if I have a sample com compression scheme, I can build a learning map. But the question is, if I know that the class has finite VC dimension, you know, where in the hell am I going to get a sample compression scheme out of? So I gave you lots of examples, and they, each of them seem to require some ingenuity to construct. So there's this conjecture with, um, so I may not, so anyway, I hope I, everything I say here is correct, but it's uh, 90, it's, it's 1 minus delta, the probability is correct. So the, the conjecture here is, does every concept class of VC dimension D have a sample compression scheme of kernel size D? And so this was kind of being looked at by, by the model theorists. Um, uh, and the, the clearly, well, this is the, the, the open direction, and this, this, this question is still open. So here are some results. So again, going back to these uh, uh, concept classes that we've introduced, which are, are gotten from logic by fixing a structure, fixing a formula, and letting the parameters vary to define a concept class. And um, uh, so here are classes where the, the, these are classes, particular concept class of finite VC dimension that do have sample compression schemes. So if there is a sample compression, compression scheme if either the, former fo the formula is stable or A is a so-called NIP structure. So, um, so let me just uh, say what it means for uh, A to be an NIP structure. Is, is a structure is an NIP structure if for every formula, so A here is an NIP structure if for every formula here, the VC dimension of this concept class is finite. So an example of an NIP structure would be, for instance, as we've seen, the reals with addition and multiplication. The VC dimension of every concept, definable concept class is finite. And if it's like this, then there's a compression scheme. So let me jump over. I have to hurry a little bit. The definition is stable. And in particular, there's a very nice result. So this, I think, was the johnson laskowski result, that if A is O-minimal, such as like the reals with addition and multiplication or the reals with additional mul multiplication and exponentiation, then a concept class that I define by a formula with parameters has a compression scheme. So this is again a, a class of a, a wide class of, of a wide uh, collection of concepts with finite VC dimension that have compression schemes of kernel size equal to the number of parameters of phi. And this is something we've been seeing again and again and again that uh, the kernel size, which here corresponds to the VC dimension, is determined by the number of parameters. Uh, and um, so this is the kind of well, these this is these were results in model theory, and then recently there is a very nice result uh, by learning theorists that somehow partially answers this conjecture that says the following: a concept class of VC dimension D and dual VC dimension D star admits a sample compression scheme of kernel size O of D times D star. So we've seen that if the the VC dimension of a concept class is D is, is finite D, then the dual class has VC dimension finite at most 2 to the D. We saw this some time ago. So this gives, uh, this D star here is at most 2 to the D. And so this gives a sample compression scheme of kernel size um, exponential in D. Uh, so it doesn't fully answer the conjecture, but at least it shows that uh, if you have finite VC dimension, you have a compression scheme. So you've got this equivalence, pack learnable, equivalent to finite VC dimension, equivalent to there exists a learning scheme, a, a sample compression scheme. So um, the proof here is actually, this is a kind of long-standing open uh, conjecture here. The proof here is, is very neat. It's some, um, I, I'm, uh, I reproduced it in the lecture, in the, in the handout notes. I don't have time to, to go through it. So it's kind of application of um, the minimax theorem in, in the, in, for zero-sum gain. So it's, um, so have you ever seen the, um, um, uh, 
the I mean, the, the, idea that you, um, the idea that you can use boosting to, to produce consistent hypotheses, uh, it, it's very much like this. So, okay, so I don't have time to go through that uh, now. Um, I haven't looked in detail at the proofs here, so I'm curious at the, the, the different machinery that's used in model, the, by the model theorists to the, to the kind of very simple-minded machinery that's uh, used here. Um, so let me wrap up, and so let me embarrass, I'm going to be very embarrassed and skip over the material that I, in my delusional mind, I thought that I would have a chance to cover. Um, okay, I'm, I mean, in my defense, I've only got like 15 years experience of teaching to uh, fall back on. Um, uh, yeah. So uh, summary. Uh, we've introduced some basic... A basic theoretical framework for supervised learning, this pack learning model, we've emphasized connections with logic. Like in my mind, I haven't spoken about automata because I just ran out of time. Uh, we have, um, but uh, in any case, Borgia will be here and we'll be talking about weighted automata. So further developments this, this week. So um, Varun will come and talk about statistical learning theory, I hope, which will touch on things that I've, I've, I've talked about here. So notions of complexity of complex uh, concept classes that go beyond the, the two-variable case, so things like Rademacher complexity, the, 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 the bi-valued case. Borgia will talk about automata learning. There will be further connections with logic and verification, so verification of learning algorithms and using learning algorithms in verification. And branching out, there'll be, like, um, you know, talks about reinforce, reinforcement learning and Bayesian learning. So there were no priors on any of the... High, I, I was... Uh, I mean, there were no prior distributions on hypotheses in... in, in um, in, in the setting here, we were just picking hypotheses that fitted the sample. Okay, so uh, thank you for bearing with my uh, uh, presentation and slight, uh, slightly technical details. <laughs>